Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, I'm just really glad to have all of you joining us today uh, as members of our organization and uh, Marta and Sean as others who can add and support um, the work that our members are doing as we reopen here in Michigan. Uh, for the folks who are tuning in, um, those who are joining us are going to be helping to share a little bit about their experience in reopening their restaurant spaces, how we're navigating the tools and resources that are available to restaurant businesses right now, and what some of those best practices are that can be operationalized into our restaurant spaces. Um, I also want to introduce myself too quickly for those who haven't met me. Um, my name is Kathleen Rourke and I serve as Local First Membership Coordinator. I'm um, so really excited to be engaging all of you today. Uh, and want to introduce to those who are joining us for the conversation. So let me tell you a little bit about them. And uh, I know that our names are on the screen, but if folks just want to wave, so hope everyone can recognize you and see who you are, that would be great. Um, we have Chris Spaulding, who is joining us from Brew Vivant and Broadleaf Local Beer, uh, two spaces that are here in the Grand Rapids is it, and Kentwood. Is it where Broadleaf is? Okay. Um, and Griselda Mata is here as well. She's joining us from Lindo, Mexico, which is located in Wyoming. Abby, Abby, is it Bumas? Abby Bumas? Okay, perfect. Who's joining us from 6-8 Coffee and Better Way Design out in Zealand. Um, and then we also have Marta Johnson, who's here. She's from the American Sustainable Business Council. Thanks, Marta. Um, and Sean Egan, who is the Deputy Director of Labor at the Labor and Economic Opportunity Office. Um, thank you all sincerely for being here. We know that right now it's just an incredibly busy time, especially for our restaurant owners and those who have retail spaces or generally, right, are re-engaging consumers um, in real time. We know that it's busy and folks are navigating so much. So we especially appreciate the time that you're spending with us today um, and hope that this is a really helpful experience for others who are navigating similar barriers and opportunities as the state reopens. Uh, so let's jump right in. Uh, we're first just going to start by getting a little bit more of the experience from some of our member businesses and reopening their restaurant spaces. So um, as we're beginning, I'm curious to know, what is the status of your business right now? What did it look like during the stay-at-home order? Um, just to kind of give us a lay of the land. Um, so Chris, I don't know if you want to kick us off. All right. So uh, we opened both pubs last Wednesday. So took about a week and a half after we were able to open. Um, we had been uh, doing carry out and delivery at Vivant for both food and beer. And then at Broadleaf, um, we had moved the kitchen over to Vivant just to have one space for, for that, um, but continued to do beer takeout. Um, so we're like, you know, almost a weekend and definitely the plans that we had in place at the um, beginning of that week have changed quite a bit. We actually have a meeting um, after this uh, webinar that we're doing um, to kind of go through and, and update all of our SOPs and our preparedness and response plan to have the, the new version of how we're responding to everything. So it's, it's been a lot of learning and uh, a lot of interesting challenges. Yeah, absolutely. And navigating the ever-changing landscape of, yeah, what opening looks like for sure. Um, Abby, what does that look like at 6-8 Coffee? Oh, let's unmute you. Oh, sorry, I always forget that. Um, no big deal. <laughs> we were closed during the stay-at-home order. Um, but we have been open, I think we opened last week as like a soft opening. Um, so we're just offering drinks right now. And normally we do like house-made soups and salads and sandwiches. Um, but we're giving it a few weeks till we reinstate that, um, mainly because our chef is <laughs> immunocompromised. So we want to give her plenty of time to like feel comfortable coming back. So um, we also are not doing like it's carry out only. Um, and then uh, another big change for us was moving our like self-serve air pots of coffee back and we're getting those for customers but other than that we am wearing masks and doing um those things but we try to be pretty clean most of the time so <laughs> it's kind of nice for a coffee shop there's um it's easy to follow the guidelines because it's such a quick simple thing to fix up so. yeah fast turnaround 
Griselda, what does that look like for you at Linda, Mexico? Yeah, so we are um, currently doing curbside pickup only, um, and we do delivery through um, DoorDash, which I, I've never before <laughs> would have done it, uh, I have to confess. But in these circumstances, I had to um, reach out to some resources, you know, that were out there. So um, mm -hmm. I actually closed um, the first, when the executive order came out, I was open for one week. And it just seems so overwhelming for me because we are not a, we're not set up to do takeout only. We are a dining experience restaurant. And so, um, you know, but I tried it, but I said, no, this is too much. And so I decided to just close um, permanently. And I reopened for curbside uh, May 5th. And so we've been open for curbside only since then. And I don't have plans to open my dining um, dining uh, anytime soon within the next two or three weeks. I'm just taking things as they, as you know, as they come and as they go and just keeping an eye night on things for me. Um, it's very important to keep my team healthy. Um, yeah. that, that's my priority at the moment. Uh, my team, I can do much without them. So I listen to their concerns. And so at the moment um, I'm doing the curbside and then um, you know, just kind of uh, doing like family dinners um, as well, offering that as well. And just, I'm just thinking of other options um, just to do, just kind of to keep the revenue coming, you know, one way or another in the meanwhile. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think each of you in unique ways raised something that, um, that is definitely a really interesting thing to think about. There's so many, obviously, barriers to um, what re-entry and reopen looks like for our consumers coming back into a space, but businesses also opening back up. Um, and I know, Abby, you mentioned, right, um, your chef who is immunocompromised, uh, as well as, right, changing all of these systems, Griselda, in your space, and, and what that looks like as well, or, or moving your operations to one headquarter, too, um, all these different things. I'm curious if maybe you can expand upon um, some of the challenges, and also, likewise, some of the opportunities that you have now as we're reopening our state. Uh, whoever wants to kick it off. Um, All right, I, I can kick it off. Um, so staff comfort, I think, is the biggest challenge, <laughs> not for all staff members, but for a lot of them. Uh, we had considered actually doing what Griselda did and, and not being open during the shut down, um, but we had enough of our management team that wanted to keep going. So we were able to get that all in place. And, and that was interesting for them. You know, they're all in leadership positions and, and now they're doing everything um, and everything differently than we had before. So that put its own stresses on the team, just trying to figure that all out with a, a small group of people. And then as we get got cl closer to reopen, um, you know, at each pub is a very different physical environment and different staff and all of that. So what the best solution for each one was different. Um, you know, at Vivant, we're known for our chapel space that is our dining room, um, which we decided not to open at this time. And we're, we're doing mostly really outside or open air, we're calling it dining. Um, just given how the staff was um, feeling and their comfort level and coming back to work, um, which is a challenge in itself because our dining room's our biggest space. So, um, you know, even further limiting what we're able to do as far as capacity. Um, and then Broadleaf is, is so different. We just opened everything. Uh, both I was thankful that the state was very easy to work with as far as um, expanding our outdoor patio areas. Um, the turnaround on that was like, I, I've never seen such a fast turnaround. Uh, I think it was less than a week from when we applied. Um, so that was really nice. And I, I think the same is true of the cities too, the city governments, like any changes we've been um, having to make, uh, they've just been so supportive and streamlining processes. Okay, I'm going to mute myself. <laughs> It's good. I love hearing all, I mean, what a unique factor we're experiencing right now um, with being in the online presence, right, to have our kiddos and different things running in the background. So that is not a problem at all, Chris. Um, yeah, Abby, Grisella, what does that look like for you in your own spaces, opportunities or challenges that you have to reopening? 
Um, we attempted to do some like limited seating, but it's really difficult. Like a lot of our business comes from the other companies in the building that we're in. Um, and so it's hard to be like, well, you can have one person sit here, but four people sitting here is not okay. <laughs> so we have just closed our like sitting in space. Um, but something, because we run two businesses out of the same location, like Better Way Designs and the coffee shop. Um, and our Better Way business really is what like helped us carry through, I think, with being closed because we really had no income coming from the coffee shop during the stay-at-home orders. Um, and so having that like kind of diverse like funds for where we could funnel things was really helpful for us, as well as like we did look at some other opportunities for e-commerce. So we have like white labeled our coffee with another company. So then they started selling our coffee as well, uh, which was really great for us. Um, and yeah, and just like online sales, I think really a lot of other companies saw a like big boost in that over this time as everyone's just at home doing nothing. So they're shopping. <laughs> um, but yeah, so those were kind of some different things that we had to like pivot towards, mm -hmm. especially, yeah, we do like home parties to sell coffee as well and like our other products like jewelry. Um, and so we've had to turn to like doing Facebook parties and getting kind of creative with that as our sales consultants couldn't go into homes. Right. Um, but yeah, so it has been, it's been a weird time of like, difficulties but we've ended up coming out the other side with more growth coming from it so that was really cool for us yeah absolutely yeah and so I'm you know I've like I said my restaurant has been mostly dining um so now I actually feel like this is like an opportunity right um and see what good can come out of it and so I feel that I'm getting experience actually doing like takeout so, <laughs> so it's like okay maybe I should start thinking about another business you know and where I can just focus for takeout or something like that um so um, I'm also looking into actually selling um our food as meals um at a, at a store right now so I'm, I'm talking with oh, them yeah. at the moment so that's another um area where I have thought about it before, but really never tapped into it or find out more. And I feel that right now I have that opportunity. You know, I have the time to really learn more about it and see if that's something that I want to keep doing. And um, it, it might be something that I will be tapping into. Uh, and so I, I just feel like it's a great opportunity. Um, the other plus side that I've noticed too is um, my team members. You know, when, when you're in such a rush all the time, you know, the restaurant industry tends to be like that at times, where you're just like running around all the time. And you really have to take the time and observe your, your staff. Well, right now, it's, I, some of them have stepped up to that level of leadership that it, it amazes me. Doesn't surprise me. I think they had it there all along. They just had never been in the position to really bring that out. And so right now I feel very blessed because I can be at home right now doing this and I have my team running the restaurant. So that's a blessing for me. And so I think that again, um, you know, I think that situations, hard situations can bring the, the best or the worst in people. And I'm so lucky that my team is really stepping up. And uh, so those are opportunities. Um, I feel that, um, I've been blessed as well with many resources to keep the business going. And so I'm trying to take as much advantage as I can um, and, and try to do as, as much good as I can. Um, I do feel sad that I have not been able to do some of the events <laughs> that I usually do in the summertime. So that's, that's a bummer, but you know, I think better days will come. So, you know, that has been challenging. My, my team is always asking me, okay, we need to do something. We need to come up with something. We need to do something. Um, because that's us. We're always doing something, um, either, you know, like Children's Day. We missed it this year. Uh, so, and, and uh, some other events that we do at the restaurant. So, but, you know, again, I think that uh, challenges are opportunities, basically. So that's kind of like the way I'm, I'm looking at it. It's an opportunity to learn more. Um, and, 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 hey, look at my team. They're doing amazing. <laughs> 
Yeah, very cool. I know I'm, I'm looking around the screen at everyone's faces, Grisilla, because as you're talking, I think everyone just had like the most enormous smile, like hearing oh. you um, share some love for your team. So that is such a cool thing. Oh, okay. Uh, but yeah, absolutely. I mean, it is so interesting, I think, to see, right, so many businesses who obviously we rely on these different sources of income, right? And when we are back into corners and have to shut down our spaces, trying to figure out like, okay, what is that? What does that mean? How do we continue to serve our staff? How do we continue to bring in diversified incomes or revenues into our spaces? And so I think everyone kind of, um, again, poked at this conversation or mentioned a couple of things already, but are there ways, Griselda, like you mentioned, maybe going into storefronts or even um, catering whole, men whole uh, meals from your, your space uh, in conjunction with DoorDash rather than having dine-in uh, people right now, but are there other ways in which folks are diversifying income or revenue for their spaces? Abby, I know you mentioned as well uh, the coffee partnerships and the ways that you're doing uh, Facebook parties and things like that. Is there more happening within 6 eight space to consider diverse income streams? Yeah, um, we have been looking into I think once our chef comes back we're looking into getting into the like food delivery um it's kind of hard with like such a low priced item for us like the delivery fees tend to like outweigh the usage of it mm -hmm. um but yeah so our like changing to to go I think just getting that word out there is going to be a bigger one for us um yeah <laughs> and Chris, too, I'm curious, I know with Brevant and Broadleaf, there are two very different concepts that you have approached, and what does it look like then to consider uh, diversified revenues or income streams for those two different concepts that you have? Um, how has that been approached? Yeah, I think like the main type of pivot we did was um, delivery. We didn't actually, like the the conversation within our industry about delivering beer and whether that was actually legal, um, <laughs> we were all very confused. So one good thing that came out of this was um, a lot of clarity from the MLCC and then um, some of the attorneys that a lot of us use. So being able to deliver beer was, um, that was awesome. Um, it's something that, you know, we're not doing a ton of, I think we're actually going to phase out delivery now that we're open. We're seeing it has a lot less of a pull. Um, but we might do some strategic delivery when we have, you know, a new brand come out. Um, and now we know exactly what we need to do in order to do that legally. Um, the other thing uh, I wish we had as an industry was the ability to, to ship beer outside of our state. And currently we don't. So, and I've advocated for our, um, our Brewers Guild to look into that as we did have a lot of people from out of state that wanted to support our brand. Um, we only distribute within Michigan, so there was really no way for them to do that. Um, but gosh, it'd sure be great if we could ship beer to them, which you know is would be expensive, but anyway, um, just another thing to look at. And then yeah. you know, my husband and I, um, obviously in the times of crisis, you have a lot of conversations you weren't planning on having, right? And um, you do open your mind up to a lot of possibilities. Um, so we have some other things that we're thinking through that um, I, I can't reveal in any way yet, but, you know, it, it's good to, you, you kind of like, you break it all down and then you can start over, right? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, what would we want to do differently looking at a clean state uh, slate? And um, like that, that's been, it is somewhat of like a hopeful thing within a time that emotionally has been really challenging. Yeah, and um, just like Chris said with the beer, I, I wish they would allow me to sell margaritas to go, you know, <laughs> that will be another way of bringing income. <laughs> but unfortunately, we can't sell tequila to go. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, as a consumer, I think both of those things would be phenomenal. <laughs> um, and then I think the other thing I'm really curious to hear hear more about from each of your spaces that, again, has been touched on to a certain degree, but um, is really the health of both the staff that you have and the consumers coming into your space. I think this is a big conversation as we're navigating what reopening looks like to have those two groups of people safely coming together over a meal, right? 
Uh, and so what things have been implemented in each of your spaces as far as making sure that there are safe measures for your employees, but also the consumer coming through? Yeah, so I'll, I'll start. So, um, you know, we're doing only curbside at the moment, but since we um, reopened for takeout, we've done um, the questionnaire and um, so that the health screening basically uh, prior to them coming in and then just kind of enforcing that uh, the vendors that are coming in are wearing a mask too, um, you know, and it's been a struggle and I, you know, I think you guys might have heard stories about this. People just don't want to, they don't want to follow the guidelines that we have for our own establishments. And so I said, okay, well, you can't come in, you know, it's, you want to deliver the product. I want your, I want the product and I need it, but I'm not going to risk the health of my team. Um, you know, I need cooperation here. It's, it's a two way street basically. So, um, and so I think that, uh, that's been very important and um, we all have to wear masks inside the restaurant even though um, you know we are not exposed to um, the public um, it's just us and we try to keep distance even inside uh, but because we know that it's it's almost impossible to at, at all times keep that six feet distance we all have to wear a mask mm -hmm. and um, you know wash you know something that we've done before now we've taken it kind of to the extreme in a sense um, you know, we have to be disinfecting areas um, every so often, um, and we don't take pay cash payments. And if we do, we have a, a special uh, protocol where we don't touch the money. It actually, when the when the customer picks up their food, they will drop their money into a bucket that's filled with Clorox and water, so we don't touch it. <laughs> and so we leave it there for you know a few minutes. Then we take it out when it's basically disinfected. Then we handle the cash. Otherwise, it, it's just an extra precaution. Um, but, you know, we have to do what we have to do to keep uh, safe. And we understand that not everybody can pay with the card over the phone or online. And so we have to be flexible as well uh, while taking the, the necessary precautions. Absolutely. Abby, what does that look like at 6A Coffee? I mean, especially on your staff, recognizing that there are some additional needs, right, to care for your team as folks are being reintroduced to your, your space and your products. Yes, so we require masks for both our staff, obviously, and for customers. Um, a big difference is for us is the masks are only required like in the coffee shop area mm -hmm. um, because we run like another business outside of the space. Um, but we also have done some different like shifting, like shift scheduling. <laughs> so we have our um, office staff is staggered a lot. So we're doing like a, now like a morning shift and a like second shift that comes in until like late at night. Um, but that's not really as much for the coffee shop. Um, but yeah, I think that um, for the most part, like we are like really strict about hand washing. So, and because our customers come in like while we're doing other things, we're used to washing hands between every single customer um, and just other practices like that. Like you have to disinfect every time you go into the coffee shop. So that's something that like our staff is already on board with and they know about. Um, so that's been good and our staff has been really great and like willing to do or go through the links to stay safe. So that's Absolutely. been good. Um, and I know you mentioned earlier too, right? The, the phasing out of products that you have, right? Providing the coffee, but not quite yet the, um, the additional sandwiches and things like that that are typically on your menu. Yeah. So that's, um, the preparation for that, yeah, has been a big shift for us, but it kind of feels like we're going back to how we used to run, because um, the coffee shop itself has been around for a long time, and just in the last year, we put in all these, like, we had a new menu and new um, food and products, um, and so we're kind of going back to how we started, which was, like, just, like, kind of slow and steady with just the drinks and figuring it out, so... It feels a little nostalgic for us, but um, it's been yeah. good. Back to the basics. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Chris, what about for your team? Yeah, a lot of the things that have been mentioned already and um, things that we're required to do, <laughs> social distancing of 
uh, the team and all of that. I think a few things, um, we do have our, our back of house and our front of house fully separated um, without any real in intermingling between them, um, which I think is smart. We did try to start with the idea of having like teams that would be the same group of people you work with and, and a number of them. Um, but that proved to be a challenge with um, the amount of shifts we had and the amount of shifts people wanted to work for various reasons. So um, we kind of had to do away with some of that, which was unfortunate, but it, so be it. We gave it a try. Um, I think the, like the biggest thing on the customer side outside of, you know, having to wear a mask is that we opted to not open either bar. Um, mm -hmm. So there's no bar seating. It, like, it's just hard. It's hard to socially distance, you know, when you only have so many stools um, from the next party, um, but also you're so close to that bartender. Mm -hmm. um, and the idea of buying, inv in investing, I should say, in so much plexiglass to create a proper barrier uh, was more than we were willing to do <laughs> right at open. Um, so we just opted to not offer bar seating. Um, and like Griselda mentioned, right, like restaurants like ours are so experience driven that it's all, it's like goes so against our natural instincts of wanting to engage and have conversations and create this um, relationship with our guests. But, you know, we can still do that in, in ways if we're creative. And I, I think we're, our staff are finding um, their comfort zone with things like that. But then there's things that, you know, they need to um, educate guests on too, right? Like if you picture one of our conversations right now, we have these big tables um, that are long, which are great if you're with a group of six or eight people, but by no means does the busser want to have to reach in front of every single person to get their dishes, right? So we have to help customers, like if, if you could move them along to the edge of the table and we can gather them at once, um, which again feels weird on an experience side because here's these dishes going and sitting at the end of the table for a minute, right? Like it's trying to navigate how do we stay with the core of um, what we've always stood for in that guest relation experience um, while also trying to be as safe as we can for our staff and our guests and, and where is that boundary. Um, but that's the stuff that we're learning more each day is um, we encounter different people. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Right. It's going to take some time to write for that engagement to happen before you realize, right, how all of this is going to play out as well. Um, I just want to thank you all for sharing some of that experience, because I think that that is a true look into what operations look like or what people are thinking through. And um, so I think that's really important to be having an open dialogue about and also sharing amongst members. So thank you for being willing to do that. Um, I just want to shift the conversation a little bit and turn it over to Marta, um, who's going to help us think through uh, what's happening right now in partnership with the state, what's available to folks, and how we uh, navigate the relief packages, safe opening, things like that. So Marta, if you want to take it away. Yeah, so um, in looking at the resources available for restaurants, I think one of the most important so far has been the um, Payload, payday production, um, new funds from, from the government. There have been a lot of issues that people have had with it, but it's provided the most direct relief. Um, so far, there are current negotiations at the federal level happening on another package of relief for um, especially small businesses. Um, it's in the House package that has been passed, and um, the Senate is looking at what they are going to um, potentially move forward, but it also might move forward in direct negotiations between the, the House um, the, and the White House, um, as well as some Senate uh, leadership. So that is under negotiations and we're, we're working at ASBC to continue to um, call for um, more relief funds as we are navigating um, reopening. There are a lot of challenges that we're seeing small businesses that have been outlined already here, but also 
um, you know, as we look at potential uh, additional waves of this um, and, and what that would uh, do to how businesses operate, um, it's important to ha be ahead of that rather than constantly playing catch up because um, what we're, we're noticing with the economists that we're, we're working with at least is um, when, when we delay action on relief, it um, further stresses our economy and is going to um, lead to additional problems beyond our um, mm -hmm. existing um, health and economic challenges. So we're looking to reduce those economic challenges um, and smooth those out as much as possible. Another important component of the next federal relief that might not seem like it's directly related to small businesses, but we see an important um, relationship to um, businesses is the uh, resource sharing with uh, the state and um, municipalities. Um, in the House proposed package, I believe it's a in the trillions of dollars um, that they're looking to share with states and um, cities because of the shortfalls that they're having right now. I think Michigan is at is it 300 million or something um, or, or more right now in terms of a, a gap in the, the budget. And so being able to fill those gaps at the federal level will give some relief um, to really important issues like education right now. Um, I think it's about a $700 per student cut that potentially is facing our schools in Michigan. Um, and that um, will have um, impacts on our whole community. And so I think as, um, as the American Sustainable Business Council and our partners are, are really interested in um, not just, uh, you know, the, the, the stock market and the health from that perspective, but the health of our whole community and, um, and looking at people, planet, and profit. We, we care about how all of these resources impact our communities um, and, and see it as an important, um, an important way to, to move our our state forward in a sustainable and uh, as smooth as possible uh, way to, uh, as we continue to deal with uh, the pandemic. So that is something to, to be aware of that there is more relief um, under consideration, both directly for businesses as well as for, for states and cities. There's also a component for families, which I think is important, both from an employee perspective, but also from a customer perspective um, to, to, to be aware of. Um, at the state level, um, there are some proposals that I'll get into, but I just wanted to highlight one of the existing resources under an earlier executive order from Governor um, Whitmer that uh, expanded the WorkShare program. So why the WorkShare program is so important right now, especially for restaurants, is as you are having um, different capacity for um, you know, for partially opening or not uh, partially opening maybe outdoor space like uh, Brewery Vivantes and not having indoor space or, you know, changing your model, there might be a different level of um, support you need for keeping operations. And so being able to keep people on and make them whole, even if you don't need quite as many hours, the WorkShare program is an elegant solution for that in which you can, um, you know, help retain and, and support employees um, in a way that doesn't um, impact your bottom line uh, in a way that your revenues aren't able to support currently as you're transitioning. And so um, the WorkShare program is, uh, is one that if you haven't already looked into it, um, I highly recommend and I can throw a link right now in the chat, which I think even the recording should be able to get um, for people to look into. Um, and then, ooh, just a second. To up there we go. Oops, there. Um, and what was great about what expanded that is it just allowed more flexibility and more types of businesses to access this um, uh, this tool, especially during um, these unusual times. Um, so that's that's one of the the main resources I want to make people aware of. The other is there is, um, and I'm still waiting on some of the details for this. Hopefully by Thursday call I'll have them. But there is a proposal within just the state of Michigan for a hundred million dollar uh, relief fund um, to support small businesses uh, it, within Michigan, and it's it's possible that it's um, open to businesses that have already accessed 
pass relief fund from payday production. So that would be a really um, important step forward to excess additional relief, um, even as federal relief is being discussed, it might have a more direct um, impact and opportunity to, to businesses reopening, restaurants and retail uh, uh, businesses. So um, I can uh, give some updates on that as is as, as happening, but it's a proposal right now um, in the Senate, and I believe it's re reflecting um, a proposal from the governor directly um, in terms of a budget amendment that would provide more direct relief to Michiganders. So those are that's a little update on the you know the most relevant existing and the most mm -hmm. promising future and most important future resources um, that I see. I would encourage anyone that's dealing with specific challenges from a resource perspective to please send me a message um, uh, either in the uh, chat here or uh, my email address um, at, that, that you can reach me at or phone number or anything. I think that you, you, um, you could, Kathleen, you can share that. Yeah, um, absolutely. I don't know the best way to do that. Make but, that available. Um, <laughs> Yeah, definitely reach out because uh, we're, we're working to also be responsive um, to specific um, needs and challenges as they arrive, as they get connected to small businesses and the, the real world challenges that they're facing. We were able to introduce a lot of behind the scenes work that was less from a, you know, past new policy perspective, which I think was really valuable in the first few months. Um, working closely with Hannah um, at Local First and our other partners um, on the ground um, to be able to um, move some solutions, behind the scenes solutions forward. So that was really um, great, but you know, try to continue to keep that conversation rolling um, so that we can be responsive. But um, I will now let yeah. someone else talk. Sean, perhaps. Yeah, thanks Martha for sharing all of those resources. I think too, as we continue to navigate this season, which is so flux with information that it's helpful to drill down and figure out where, where do I need to pay the most attention um, for my business to move forward and succeed. Um, so yeah, I wanna turn it over to Sean um, from the Labor and Economic Opportunity Office. Sean, if you just would be able to help us navigate, again, what some of those workplace safety measures are that we need to institute or best practices that we can operationalize. I think too, that there's a lot of conversations surrounding um, unemployment and how we work again with our staffs. And so if you're able to address that, I think would be really helpful. Um, absolutely. And I'd just like to say thank you, Kathleen, and everybody for inviting me to be with you today. It's really awesome to hear these types of conversations and all of the creative things that you're trying to do in your businesses and workplaces. Um, I am very thankful to hear that everybody recognizes that this is a public health crisis which has caused an economic crisis, which as we begin to reopen, brings into play a lot of workplace safety concerns um, and as well as other tools. And Abby, uh, a big kudos to you and working with your cook who has an underlying health condition. That is a message that I try to send all the time that you know we have to recognize that as businesses start to re-engage, it's gonna be, there's two pieces at play here. And just because the business might be ready to open doesn't necessarily mean the employees are ready to be back. Uh, for a lot of reasons. It could be childcare, underlying health conditions, maybe they have COVID or a family member does. Uh, so there's a timing piece that's very, very difficult to navigate and is not something we can control. So I appreciate all the work that you're all doing. And uh, one of the first things I always try to reiterate is that while there's a lot of, uh, I would, I, I hesitate to call it noise, but there's a lot of noise in the news regarding COVID, but some of the facts have not changed in any way, shape or form. And what we know is that this thing transmits primarily through aerosols and large droplets that come out of us when we're talking, sneezing, coughing, or doing anything. So if we're maintaining that social distance, in theory, gravity and evaporation are gonna make sure that the virus is dispersed enough that uh, the, uh, enough to sort of make us uh, get it is not gonna happen. When we can't do that, we have to wear these face coverings. Now, we've all heard that Outdoors is better than indoors. Indoors creates its own challenges. So I'm so thankful to hear all of you uh, requiring these face coverings because the science is really telling us that face coverings are the critical component to preventing further outbreaks in our communities. And we know that uh, from the science and we're seeing that in states that are reopening in, in other parts of the country where uh, frankly, you know, restaurants and bars are 
those spots, gyms, you know, those kind of congregation centers that are going to be so critical to containing this virus and ensuring businesses like yours uh, and spreading that message that uh, no shirt, no shoes, no mask, no service is critical to really containing this outbreak. And I'm very thankful to hear that you're all doing that. So um, as Kathleen mentioned, I'm the Deputy Director for Labor in Michigan's Department of Labor. And what that means to everybody is that uh, I oversee my OSHA workers comp, the wage and hour division, and the Bureau of Employment Relations. So at least three or four agencies that most of you are used to hearing from or seeing or dealing with. Uh, a couple weeks ago, the governor also appointed me as the director for COVID workplace safety in Michigan. And that's going to be more of a coordinating role across agencies and doing a lot of these types of outreach events. Uh, and I also, while I don't work directly for unemployment, I do a lot of outreach on their behalf just to lend another person that can hopefully speak intelligently most of the time about unemployment issues. Uh, some of the nitty gritty is a little beyond me, but I can get through uh, a lot of the questions. So I'll touch on a couple of those points. One of the things we've been doing from the beginning of this outbreak, and I'm gonna start with this because every business group that I talk to asked me this question, how is this gonna be enforced? Uh, now, if you've worked with my OSHA, our goal is to educate, do consultations, give you the tools to make sure that you're in compliance, so we don't start with that discussion, but uh, my OSHA certainly has the tools they need to enforce the CDC guidelines as well as the executive orders if it comes to that. By and large, COVID is new. I remind everybody it's the novel coronavirus, which means none of us are familiar with it. None of us have the immunities to deal with it. And none of us know exactly what we're doing, right? So we're, we're reading the science and our scientists are working at lightning speed to keep up with how this thing is changing and morphing and how it's spreading, um, our tools will change. So we developed a website landing page specifically with my OSHA information, which is michigan.gov forward slash COVID workplace safety. I put that in the chat box as well. Uh, and that has my OSHA specifically created guidance. I know that several of you worked with the work groups that put together, together best practices. Um, Ours will be a little bit differently because ours are built around the CDC guidelines as well as the executive orders specifically. The work groups focused on building uh, sort of reach goals, best practices, things that business can do in, in addition to these underlying pieces. So both are great tools, but uh, uh, we have one for every industry that's been named in a, an executive order, which certainly includes restaurants and bars. Uh, we also have general industry guidelines. We have some videos there. We have links to the My Symptoms app from the Department of Health and Human Services, which is a great tool to help you cover that health screening process. And as long as uh, the way that works is as an employer, you're gonna you set up an employer account and you'll get a number that your employees will then set up their own account and link to that number. So the information comes back to the employer and as long as uh, they fill out that app, it'll show on their phone, you know, green, I'm good, orange, I, you know, I answered the question and, and it's possible I might have been exposed or I have symptoms. As long as they show that to you before they come into work, that should meet the requirements of the health screening. Uh, we're still working through a couple of pieces, so we'll have a better update, but it's a great tool. I encourage everybody to use it. It'll make it a lot simpler. Uh, you can set it up to notify whomever you'll get a report on who filled it out. And it'll also do part of the, if somebody is a positive COVID, it'll send a notice to the public health department too. So you'll kind of have those two pieces covered. Um, so those tools are there. We have a link to the Michigan Economic oh, no. Development Corp that's been used to help identify uh, PPE or barriers or hand sanitizer or other products. It's all made in Michigan, which I love. Uh, and there's a lot of capacity there. I checked in with them right after I got the additional title. And uh, they, they're very confident that the manufacturers they're working with have the capacity to meet the needs of industries across the state of Michigan. So definitely check in there. There's a nice link there. Um, and we do have some posters and other things. We're continuing to create new things. And I would encourage you to check back often because as executive orders change or as we learn new things, that's really where we're putting our updates. 
uh, and it's a great tool to use. Restaurants and bars in particular create some extra uh, challenges. And I was very happy to hear, Chris, that you closed the bars. I know that is not easy. I would, I would love to, uh, to see everybody open at full capacity. The 50% requirement has nothing to do with trying to kill restaurants. I can assure you that. Um, we recognize that that's not a profitable venture at 50% seating capacity. But like we said, this is a public health crisis that we're trying to contain uh, as smartly and as quickly as we can. And uh, those are challenges that we have to meet. Uh, the customers in the facial coverings were covered in Executive Order 115, which requires anybody that leaves their house and goes into a public space, which includes bars, restaurants, gyms, and everybody else, that they're required to wear a face covering as long as they're medically able. And then a corresponding component, which you are all can, are using, is that uh, a, a business may, dis, may deny service to those refusing to wear the face covering. I, you know, just a reminder, and I know you're all thinking about it, some folks are medically unable to wear those face coverings. You're going to have employees that are medically unable to wear those face coverings. So you'll need to navigate through that the best that you can. Uh, my, the way I always say this is that we can manage the folks that are medically unable to wear a face mask. We cannot manage all of the public saying they're not going to do it. So I really, again, appreciate you guys taking that stance because it's critical. Uh, so those are some good tools from uh, both MIOSHA as well as the Department of Labor. If you go to the Department of Labor's homepage, we do have postings for those other industry guidelines. I can tell you all of us at the state, as Chris mentioned with uh, probably the Liquor Control Commission, um, everybody is working very, very fast to be responsive and try to answer these questions, permits, everything that we need to do as quickly as, as we can to make sure that you can expand, that you can open in a smart way and be ready to serve uh, your customers and uh, in, in just trying to make that happen. So uh, one other thing I would say is that um, we do have down at the bottom of that page a link to guidance or a policy from the unemployment agency that deals with suitable work and when people can still qualify for unemployment insurance. Uh, it includes all of those underlying health conditions and things, some pregnancy, some uh, work, uh, child care issues, as well as unsafe workplaces. So there's a lot of ways that Michiganders can still qualify for unemployment benefits, even if you ha may have a position available for them. Uh, certainly the governor's trying to recognize that you know, we want to support businesses and see them grow, but at the same time, we have working people that are going to need help too. So uh, trying to make balance that out has been um, a challenge, but it's a welcome challenge. There's, and working with folks like you makes it a, a heck of a lot easier as we're trying to find that sweet spot of where everything's kind of going to click. Uh, a couple of quick points on unemployment. Um, I was talking with Chris yesterday about a couple of issues your industry has some unique challenges, right? Because you have a lot of part-time folks. You have a lot of tipped employees, which are, you know, are different on the way they measure their income. Uh, it's a challenge sometimes for those folks to qualify for unemployment to begin with, because you still have to meet that earnings threshold. It's 37, uh, 40, I believe, uh, in a in a quarter basically, and, and they look back a couple of quarters, that still exists there. Those folks may now qualify for that additional $600 weekly benefit, but it's still a challenge um, going forward. So, but if, if they have qualified and they are collecting benefits and they're kind of coming back, but they're not full-time back, um, the customers aren't back. So we know that tips aren't as good as, as they were. So, they can continue to certify for benefits and you can earn up to 1.5 times your weekly benefits. So let's say your weekly benefit comes out at 200, the max is 362, but let's say it comes out at 200, you could earn up to $300 in that week and still qualify for the Michigan benefit as well as the additional $600 benefit. If you go over that amount, your benefit for that week would be reduced to zero. It would say something like you're ineligible for benefits for that week. Uh, and you should still be able to qualify for the next week. I, we, you recertify for two week periods. Chris raised a question to me that 
uh, we're going to seek out an answer to where that didn't work quite right for somebody, but we're going to, we'll figure that out. Now, let's say for those couple of weeks, you don't get a benefit, uh, but you, you just keep recertifying. And as long as you're trying to keep that claim open, if you hit those weeks where you didn't make enough or you didn't make anything, you'll get benefits for those weeks. You just kind of keep it going. And the folks can do that for that 26 week period, which is actually 39 right now because of the federal extension. Um, the, the only drawback is, is that even if you don't get a dollar in that week because you made too much, it still counts as a week. So you'll lose a week off your 30, 26 or 39 week benefit period. So you want to be aware of that. And then as Marta said, uh, we highly, highly encourage those businesses that are able to use the WorkShare program. It's a wonderful system. Uh, they're doing pretty well at uh, getting through plans. It doesn't have to be for all of your employees. It can be for just a group of your employees. The governor expanded it out so you can cut hours by as little as 10%, which if you're working full time is about four hours a week, or as much as 60%, which would be about 24 hours per week. And folks would qualify for some portion of their unemployment benefit, as well as the additional $600 federal benefit. Uh, and the employer handles all that. So your employees don't file claims, they don't do all that stuff. The employer actually handles the recertification that they're still on short hours. So it makes it very, very simple to use. And you can have one plan for your company. You can have multiple plans for your company. You can have different plans for different groups of employees. So I know on the server side, you know, it might be more challenging, but for those that Brewers Guild you mentioned, uh, maybe it works there where those folks are more likely to have sort of a normal shift. So those are great tools. Uh, as you're opening up your restaurant, I, I just, you know, as you are have all said, you know, think about how this thing spreads. Think about how you keep it safe and, uh, you know, keep, keep thinking and keep being creative on how you protect your employees as well as your customers. Uh, certainly some of the employee ones, in my opinion, are a little bit easier because they're spelled out a little more clearly. The customer side is probably a little more fuzzy, but uh, same concepts, just different people for the most part. You know, that, the, that breathing, that aerosol, that, you know, droplets, we don't like to say we spit when we talk, but we do. Those droplets coming out of us, keeping that social distance, recognizing that those fall onto surfaces, thinking about the ventilation in your space to try to increase the amount of outside air. Uh, you know, as, as an example, in cars, if you have passengers, you're a driver, we're, the recommendation is don't use that recirculating feature. In your business too, your HVA system will have some parameters that will allow you to pull in more outside air to help keep the environment a little more clear. Um, as you can tell, I've turned into a politician and I can talk for hours, but I see we have about seven minutes left. So I would love to uh, just kind of stop there and hopefully I've been helpful. And if not, uh, I'll try again and take some questions if you'd like to shoot any at me. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Sean. And if it's okay, I, I uh, can provide the contact information as well. I gave will be for Marta um, for folks who are watching this later and have questions. Uh, but again, just want to emphasize that it is really helpful to have these resources being shared in this medium. I think it's great, again, in a time when there's so much information available and uncertainty about what it's going to look like a week from now, three weeks from now, you know, a couple yeah. months from now that it's helpful to drill down on some information. Yeah, so, I'm really hopeful that if we, if everyone will take it as serious as you are, which I think most businesses I've talked to are, they're just trying to navigate like how you handle the customers primarily, um, that we don't look like those other states, right? We know the governor has shown that she will protect Michigan families and we appreciate her for that. Uh, and that scale slides both ways, right? So as we move forward, if we start to see these outbreaks, you know, there's no question that uh, we're going to put ourselves in a precarious position to make sure we can stay open. And I want to stay open. I don't want to, we don't want to do this over and over again. We want to do it one time. We want to do it right. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's really important as we're 
um, navigating the situation on top of other situations that are happening in our communities and across the nation that we just really need to be having open dialogue and conversation about how folks are navigating this, what experiences people are having. And I think, Priscilla, as you mentioned, right, how we take those challenges and morph them into opportunities or think of them as opportunities rather than challenges first. Um, so I'm really grateful for uh, that experience.